Good evening, everyone. Uh, Kaya Monju. Uh, my name is Shamit Sagar, and it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to the UWA Public Policy Institute live webinar, webinar on vaccinations and COVID myth busting. Uh, you're welcome. It's late afternoon, early evening here. It's getting dark on a unseasonably uh, wet afternoon here in Perth, and you're welcome from every time zone that you're joining us, both in Australia and internationally. Uh, as I said, I'm Shamit Sagar. I'm the director of the Public Policy Institute. Uh, and can I just quickly say a word or two about the Institute before we get going? Uh, we were established uh, in late 18, 2019, and we are part and parcel of a concerted attempt to ensure that the uh, research output and the insights grown by our research at the University of Western Australia are shared as widely as possible, particularly with government, business, nonprofits, and campaign groups. Uh, the Institute is in common with many efforts that have been taken across the world amongst re leading research intensive universities to ensure that the research is in the hands of decision makers in government and beyond. It's very much my pleasure to invite you in, to join us this afternoon as part of this webinar on uh, vaccinations and COVID myth busting. Um, can I, before I go any further, just as is our custom here at UWA, share the UWA acknowledgement? And that is as follows. The University of Western Australia acknowledges that its campus is situated on Noongar land, that the Noongar people remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs and knowledge. Therefore, on behalf of UWA, I wish to pay tribute to their elders and leaders, past, present and future. Thank you. So let us turn to the issue of the day, uh, vaccinations and the COVID pandemic. Uh, our purpose this afternoon is not to rehearse every conceivable aspect of something that has been rehearsed in many different fora in the course of the last year and a half, but it is to actually to focus in upon Australia and uh, where we are in relation to the pandemic and vaccinations. Uh, one way to look at that in terms of scene setting would be to think about Australia as being the would-be country of zero COVID uh, in our society. Uh, it's an unusual case amongst particularly the rich developed world where our strategy overwhelmingly depends upon three things. First of all, uh, the uh, bringing about interna of international travel restrictions. Uh, for what it's worth, ABC polling recently revealed that 79% of us are in favour of retaining those international restrictions until and unless the international pandemic is brought under control. Secondly, the use of quarantines, both short and long, uh, both in institutions as well as home. And lastly, most visibly of all, lockdowns to suppress outbreaks of the virus. And it may interest our audience to know that in that sense, it is a strategy that has been working uh, in inverted commas. Cases per million of our population in Australia stand at 1,200 in comparison to, for what it's worth, 70,000 per million in the United Kingdom. And by contrast, deaths stand at 35 per million of our population against 1,900 per million in the United Kingdom. So the question for most people is, could or would that sh strategy shift in the foreseeable future? And the answer to that question undoubtedly will depend on the answer to another question, which is what's, what is the role and efficacy of vaccines as part of combating the international pandemic? As we speak at this very moment, I should remind our audience, if they need reminding Australia, that over half our population is under a full uh, lockdown restriction. The main weapon, not necessarily the choice, but by default here in Australia, has been the use of lockdowns, particularly in urban centres, particularly on the East Coast, and as, as of uh, uh, earlier today, South Australia as well. There's been plenty of changing advice, both intentional and unintentional, and to add to all that misery, there's been an outbreak of some degree of jostling between states, and our general election is nearby, probably in the early part of 2022. All of that also leads to questions to do with expertise and dissent. And so our role is to try to shed light on all of that. And our purpose this afternoon will be to do three things if we can. First of all, to straighten out facts where they can be straightened out. Second of all, to respond proportionately to public uncertainties, where that can be done. And then lastly, to provide an informed understanding of where vaccines sit in relation to a wider set of responses to national and international uh, uh, efforts in response to the COVID pandemic. 
Uh, what we've done is at the point of registration, we've asked people who want to take part on, in this webinar to put forward uh, questions for our panel. And we broadly have sort of six areas of interest and concern, and we'll get to the detail of that in a minute. But they involve things to do with uh, manufacturers and distributors of the vaccines. Secondly, issues around hesitancy. Thirdly, the details around trials, side effects and longer term effects. Fourthly, specifically pregnancy and breastfeeding. Uh, fifthly, travel, particularly international prospects for. And then lastly, questions around communicating and messaging what it is that we're seeking from the vaccine rollout. So to help shed light on all of that, we have uh, assembled an expert five member panel and let me now introduce them to you. We have on the screen in front of me in the bottom left hand corner, I imagine very similar for our audience, is my colleague, Dr. Katie Atwell. I'll briefly describe something about Katie and the other panel members. Uh, time doesn't permit me to go into their full biography. Uh, but Katie is amongst other things, an ARC Discovery Early Career Research Fellow. She's a member of the Governance Committee of the Collaboration on Social Science and Immunization, COSI. She is on top of that an honorary fellow of the West Farmers Center for Vaccine Infections Diseases at the TKI Institute here in Perth. Uh, and most notably of all for us, she is a fellow of the Public Policy Institute. Katie, welcome. Secondly, she is joined in the bottom right hand corner uh, by Chris Blythe. Uh, Chris is an Associate Professor of Paediatrics in the School of Medicine here at UWA. He is a co-director of the West Farmers Centre of Vaccines and Infectious Diseases at the TKI Institute. Uh, and most notably, he is the co-chair of the Australian Technically Advis Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation, ATAGI. And for those who are not in the know, ATAGI is the peak scientific immunisation advisory committee to the Commonwealth Government in Canberra. Uh, as part of ATAGI, uh, Chris is also the co-chair of the working group on COVID vaccines. Thirdly, I'm joined by Melinda in the top right hand corner, Melinda Boss. Melinda is a pharmacist and a senior research fellow in the School of Allied Health at UWA with a specialism in breastfeeding experience for mothers and infants. She has been instrumental in setting up two very important websites. The first LACTA map, L-A-C-T-A-M-A-P, is an international collaborative glossary of lactation terminology for science and medicine. And the second, Lactopedia, L-A-C-T-A, P-E-D-I-A, is an online lactation care support system. You're very welcome to look at that in your own time. On top of all of that, she was uh, named as Western Australia's Pharmacist of the Year in 2019, by the Pharmaceutical Association of Australia. So very belated congratulations. Fourthly, we're joined by Dr. Archer Fox. Uh, Dr. Fox is a senior lecturer in the School of Human Sciences and also in the School of Molecular Sciences at UWA. She's an affiliate investigator with the Harry Perkins Institute for Medical Research. And in 2012, she was the recipient of the Marshall Medal of the Harry Perkins Institute. More recently in 2012, she received the Emerging Lever Award of the Australia New Zealand Society of Cell and Developmental Biology. And then last but not least, in the middle of my screen is Dr. Barbara Natabi. Barbara is a senior lecturer in the School of Population and Global Health at UWA. Prior to that, she was, the, she was at the West Australian Centre for Rural Health between 2010 and 2019, where she held an early, early career research fellowship. She has interests in epidemiology, prevention and control of communicable diseases, particularly amongst dis disadvantaged communities. And she has prior to that, many years of experience of working in disadvantaged and marginalized communities in Northern Uganda. That's the panel. Can I just point out for our audience, as I said a moment ago, we have pulled together a large number of questions and we'll take a selected cross-section of those in a second. Um, our priority will be that in, that in the first instance. But because this is a live session on Zoom, you're very welcome to chip in with questions as we go along, and we'll do our best to take those, particularly when they relate to the theme of the discussion at the time. It'd be very helpful if you could make sure that your questions are short, clear and respectful, and I'll do my best to sort of, as I said, bring them in. Our event this afternoon is being recorded. We'll be putting on YouTube later on this week, 
And lastly, just to let you know, there are media representatives who are joining us in the online audience, and they may well use parts of the webinar for later, later broadcasts and on different platforms. Right, that's all the preliminaries out of the way. Thank you for your patience. What we should do now is get cracking with the actual questions and discussion. Um, so we have quite a large number that have been collected, and I'm going to begin and get the ball rolling by asking, um, in the first instance, Chris, if I may, a general question about vaccines. And I'm taking it verbatim as, as it came in, so we don't lose the essence. And the question, Chris, is as follows. Um, which is what is taken into consideration when weighing up the potential benefits and risks of vaccines? And the questioner is particularly interested in what kind of data is looked at, what are the methods that are used to weigh it all up, and what would it take to change the initial advice, and how much time might that take? So I'm going to ask Chris to talk about that stuff to start with, and I will bring in the panel, no doubt, and have something to say about that. Chris. Thanks, Matt, for the question, and I might talk vaccines in general and then also try and bring that into a COVID specific situation. So clearly any health intervention, whether that be vaccines or otherwise, we are weighing up risks and benefits. We do it in our daily lives. Vaccines, what we're trying to do is we're trying to prevent people getting infected with something that circulates in the community. And so really the primary role of a vaccine is to try and prevent infection. Um, and the risks of a vaccine are clearly any side effects that you may get from the vaccine and other things such as cost and things like that. But really, when we're thinking about vaccines, we're weighing up what protection we get against an infection against any potential side effects. So if we think about that in a COVID situation, what are the potential benefits of a COVID vaccine? Well, let me sort of summarise sort of some of the major issues there. I suppose the first thing is clearly, you know, pandemic, everyone is at risk of COVID and its complications and really highlighting that actually the older you are, the greater at risk of severe complications from COVID you are. That risk is not going away clearly and will increase with time, particularly as we decrease um, public health interventions such as borders and quarantines and things like that. So COVID is not going away and I'm happy to talk about why it's not going away. It's going to be ever pre present. Vaccination is clearly the, something that allows you to protect yourself, but also protect your family, your workmates, your community, protect those around you. Uh, and so that's why we believe that everyone should have access to a vaccine. Um, all vaccines are associated with side effects. The vast majority of those are mild. Some of them are severe. And any vaccine, when we use it for the first period of time in clinical trials, we are looking hard to see what the expected side effects are and importantly, what the rare side effects are. So they're the things that we're balancing all the time, both at the time of registration of a vaccine, and importantly, that how well does it work? What are the side effects goes into registrations of vaccines? But really importantly, when you're rolling out programs, looking really hard at those benefits and those risks as your knowledge of a vaccine rolls out. And that's what we've done in the COVID space as we have started to use these vaccines at a population level. I'm happy to answer any other questions though, Shami. Uh, just Chris, going to probe you slightly. I mean, might you be able to sort of comment on the extent how long it might take for initial advice to be reconsidered? Is there kind of an expected time frame, or is it too difficult to tell, to tell in this case? It depends, well, Public health advice is always reconsidered. And importantly, you need to have significant confidence in the data to make an adjustment to a program. Um, and so that may take a number of weeks. If it's a very strong signal, it may take many years if it's a very weak signal. So I think it's too hard to generalize. But I can talk about in the COVID space, you know, when we started introducing COVID vaccines in Australia, we had two months of experience internationally of using vaccines to look to. And clearly we were looking very hard at what was happening internationally to inform what our program was. Um, and importantly, we've continued to monitor those how well is it working, any side effects. The tricky thing, particularly as far as how well does it work, you need disease to work out whether a vaccine is working. So we're not gonna be able to 
tell how well it's working in the Australian context, there's not a lot of disease. So really how effective a vaccine is working with needed international data to really understand how well these vaccines are working. And importantly, we're seeing tremendous results, particularly from the UK and the US, where some of the results are really pretty stark. Okay, all right. Well, no doubt we're going to come back to that. Um, is anyone in particular wants to come in on that? My, my colleagues here? No? Okay, well, I'm going to go to a set of questions that came in, which actually flow on from that, which have to do with really the time frame. I think this goes to the essence of it. So, um, Archer, I wonder if I could put the following question to you to start with. And the question is, how do we trust the long-term impacts of what is described as a rushed, a rushed product in the absence of evidence? Yeah, so I think that word rushed is very emotionally loaded, isn't it? Um, and it implies that corners have been cut. Um, and I think that's something that, um, you know, people are concerned when they're thinking about this word rushed. Um, the reality is that most previous vaccines have taken longer to develop than the COVID vaccines. Um, but it is because we have had a worldwide coordinated effort with essentially unlimited amounts of funding, um, unlimited amounts of trial participants with wide circulating virus in the population, um, very short timeframes from infection to symptom onset, unlike some other clinical trials where you have to wait a long time before you can see whether the agent that you're testing is effective. So um, I think those are the main reasons. In a normal situation, you have long lags or delays in the development of new medical products where um, barriers to do with lack of funding, lack of trial pa participants um, come into play, but that didn't come into play here. Um, and, and the relative you know, others in the panel might be able to speak to this better than me, but the regulatory bodies have used the same criteria as they've used in the past. Um, and Chris is probably more of an expert there. Um, but in, in effect, we're all benefiting from a lot of luck that, that particularly these mRNA vaccines, which I have a fair bit of knowledge about, um, have been so effective and have been much more effective than the 50% um, efficacy bar that was originally set by, um, I believe it was the World Health Organization. So the message would be, um, although the vaccines were developed quickly, uh, corners were not cut and um, all of the necessary regulatory um, factors that had to be considered for it to be approved um, were abided by. Okay, thank you. Um, so here's a question that actually has been put to the panel, and I think it probably goes to the essence of this. I like, I'd like a short answer we can from every panel member. And it says, and I'm going to quote exactly, would the panel objectively describe the current vaccination programs around the world as an extremely large set, large scale set of clinical trials? Panel. I'm happy to jump in, Shamit. I don't think it's a clinical. I don't think it's a clinical trial. Um, we routinely do post licensure evaluation of vaccines, and that is what's happening at the moment, and that's really important. Um, speaking to Archer's comment, actually, the amount of clinical trial participants was very similar in these trials to other vaccines that we've registered for the last 15, 20 years. But no, we're not conducting a clinical trial around the country, but we're evaluating the product that we're using. Um, other quick comments on that to the panel? Barbara, Melinda, Katie? Katie, go ahead. I would also just add to that, that if we have the vaccines available and they've been through the rigorous te testing that um, Archer has described, it would actually be really unethical to sit on them and to, and to not be rolling them out in a pandemic context for which they've been developed. So I think, you know, that's the kind of question that we might ask from here in Australia or Western Australia where we're not locked down at the moment and we don't have much experience of COVID-19. I think if we were sort of living somewhere like Italy or the United Kingdom or Africa, we might have very different perspectives 
on um, whether we were feeling that, you know, this is some great experiment that's going on. Rather, it would be this is the thing that's actually saving lives right now. Barbara, Melinda, just brief responses if you want. Um, just to reiterate what Chris has said, that we always continue to um, monitor what happens. So for any vaccine that people receive in this country, whether it's a measles vaccine or otherwise, there's a constant um, evaluation of whether people are getting side effects or not. So the fact that we are constantly monitoring what's happening with COVID um, vaccines does not make it an experiment. And yes, I would just jump in and say I, I agree. Um, we're in a different situation in Australia to um, much of the rest of the world. And in a lot of ways, we've benefited from that, from being able to see what has happened overseas before we have to do it, uh, implement things here. Okay, thank you. All right, so there's a batch of questions now, which have much more to do with the efficacy of the issues, you know, just how much effectiveness are we squeezing out of the vaccines that are out there right now? So I'm going to put them to uh, different members of the panel. Here's one uh, I'd like to put to Barbara if I can. And it says, can one still, can an individual still contract and spread COVID-19 when they are vaccinated? Yes, so the short answer to that is yes, you can still contract and spread um, COVID-19 if you are vaccinated. It is understood that it is less so than if you're not vaccinated, but yes, you can still um, contract and spread it. The, and that's why it's very important for everybody to get their own vaccine, not uh, assuming that someone else's vaccination is going to protect them. So that's why we need as many people to get vaccinated as possible. And I'll talk to the numbers later on. Okay. Um, here's a question um, I'm going to put to, well, Chris, but anyone else is more than welcome to come in. I'm going to again quote it exactly so I don't misrepresent what someone wants to try, try to get at. And they said, I've just had the AstraZeneca vaccine. So how effective will this be in combating COVID-19? And in particular, the Lambda variant that's spreading through South America. Any thoughts on that? Uh, there's a couple of bits in there. So what do we know about how effective different vaccines are? Well, we know that vaccines are more effective against severe disease than they are mild disease. That's what they've been designed to do. And so if we're talking about the effectiveness of vaccine, we often talk about how well it keeps you out of hospital, as opposed to how well it might affect uh, infection. Specifically talking about variants, we know that all the variants have slightly different effectiveness estimates by different vaccines. We don't have great data about the Lambda variant, which is circulating in Peru at the moment, but we do have emerging data about the Delta variant, which is circulating on the East Coast at the moment. And it looks like the AstraZeneca vaccine, which your recipient has just received, is between about 70 and 90% effective against hospitalization for the Delta variant. Importantly, all of these viruses are slightly changing over time. And so we're going to have to continue to monitor how well our current vaccines work against them and whether we need to update those vaccines or whether there's role for boosters over time. Okay. And Chris, can I just probe you on that? So, I mean, introducing a distinction, which may be uh, is part of your answer, the distinction between contracting COVID on the one hand and becoming seriously unwell. Is it, is, it, is it worth emphasising that distinction in terms of how we look at the numbers? I think it is. So, and the great example is what's happening in the UK at the moment. Many people would have hear, heard that the increasing case numbers in the UK at the moment, particularly with the Delta variant, but at this stage, that's not flowing onto an increase in their hospitalizations because they have a broadly vaccinated adult population with many protected against the more severe forms. Um, and so in an Australian situation, we want to prevent against harm, which is really protecting against the severe aspects. Now, we may, importantly, impact on transmission, but our focus needs to remain on really the severe end. So that's where the vaccines really are the most effective, um, as opposed to preventing transmission or very mild infection. Okay. But we're going to come back to that. There are quite a lot of questions on, on what I essentially are kind of technical aspects of judging the evidence and comparing different, uh, different vaccination programs. Um, I'm just going to change the topics somewhat now. And I'm drawing Katie, my colleague, um, and it's, it's a broad question. It says, so why is there hesitancy to accept the vaccinations? Katie. 
So that's a complicated question. Vaccine hesitancy is a complex concept. It's multifaceted. It draws on local drivers and experiences and people who are hesitant about vaccines will be hesitant about them for different reasons. So one of the most important things to emphasize from the beginning is, you know, you're probably hearing and reading a lot about people being hesitant about the COVID-19 vaccines. Some of that is actually a mislabel. So sometimes it's people are not perhaps sufficiently able to access vaccines. Um, the, the rollout is imperfect. So people are um, not necessarily able to get the vaccines that, you know, that they want when they want them and where they want them. So it's important not to conflate the uptake that we're seeing with people's attitudes. There are lots of other factors that go into the uptake that we're seeing. But we are seeing, and everybody would have encountered this already in the media, we are seeing higher rates of concern um, around the vaccines that are available or people saying that they intend to wait a bit longer or that they're not sure if they'll have the vaccine and some people, a small number of people saying they won't. And it's important to remember that this is not people being anti-vax. Um, in fact, we are a nation of vaccinators. Our vaccination rates for children are higher than they've ever been, sitting at between uh, 92 and 95 percent, depending on the age um, we're looking at for kids. So we're a nation of vaccinators. Understandably, when there are new vaccines available, and particularly when we're in this kind of crazy context that we are with COVID-19, it has turned our world upside down. And people are not always good at making assessments uh, for themselves or for those around them about um, the benefits and risks of particular scenarios, uh, especially in situations of stress. And I would add to that, that because we don't have COVID-19 in this country, because our governments have by and large, well, I say that we do on the East Coast, of course, um, but by and large, our governments have done a fantastic job of protecting us from the, the ravages that the rest of the world has seen from this disease. I think it does generate a sense, and I think this is a very West Australian vibe, um, that we are kind of, you know, we're, we're just chilling here on the West Coast. We're by and large going about our normal lives. We're traveling in our caravans up and down the coast and, you know, just kind of biding our time and waiting, waiting for the world to, to get to wherever it gets and waiting for our country to get to wherever it gets. And I think that, you know, in the absence of um, the, the real and pressing danger of COVID-19 at our doors, um, that, that there is a sense of perhaps complacency around um, not necessarily reasoning about, you know, like in a context where there's a lot of COVID-19, people would be seeing the vaccine as, as having a direct protective benefit for them and their loved ones right now. And so in somewhere like Australia and Western Australia, uh, everything feels a bit distant and a bit far away. But certainly we're seeing on the East Coast that there's an absolute run on the vaccine clinics when there's an outbreak. So it's kind of unfortunate that we, we sort of see that as happening somewhere else rather than perhaps that's happening here. It seems to have to happen here for there to be a, a run on something. So I think there's a range of factors going on there. Um, but I would certainly stress that um, we don't have a massive vaccine hesitancy problem. We do have supply constraints that are affecting the speed and pace of our rollout. We do need better public messaging from government um, to get us excited, to get us activated. And for those of us who do have access to vaccines right now, which is our over 60s who can access the AstraZeneca vaccine, I think we need some more um, messaging and campaigning for those folks so that they feel really reassured in going to get vaccinated right now to protect themselves. Because if we do have an outbreak, if we do have the Delta strain coming here, they're the ones who are going to be at highest risk of having those kind of adverse um, you know, outcomes if they're infected with COVID-19. Okay. Can I press you, Katie, slightly? So I'm, I'm hearing that there is a relationship between how much the prevalence of um, infection out there in a given society, any place, mentioned WA, and sort of appetite and take up. There seems to be some sort of relationship. So, you know, the wolf is not at the door kind of argument. Okay. Yeah. So how do you get around this? I mean, obviously no one's going to advocate, let's, you know, let COVID sort of rip in a society in order to get vaccinations up. And yet the, the bit of reality is that there's some sort of relationship there. People are sufficiently scared or animated to roll their sleeves up when they can see the real and present danger. I mean, how would you respond to that? There's a, there's a terrible paradox here. There is a terrible paradox and we need to be honest about it. But we also need to remember that fear of getting the disease is not the only sort of thing in our arsenal, right? There are other ways that people can be motivated 
to go and get the vaccine. And I think importantly, we need to wait until we're at a state of full supply. We need to wait until we have the opportunity for everybody who wants to be vaccinated to be vaccinated. I haven't been vaccinated yet. I haven't been able to access the vaccine yet. That's gonna happen for me next month. You know, I know some younger people who have been, but I know lots of other younger people who are waiting um, for supplies to be available. So we can't really um, panic about this sort of problem too much when we don't have sufficient supply. And, in, you know, I think if we were to see an outbreak here in Western Australia, we would see a run on the supplies we have. But when we have more of a supply, what we'll also be generating then is a social norm. So the more people who know people who've been vaccinated, who can talk about not having had side effects, which um, I'm quite jealous of my um, peers on this call, on this, on this video conference, most of whom have been vaccinated and said, yeah, you know, I had my vaccine, it was no big deal. Um, so the more that people can hear about that, or, you know, yeah, I had it and I had a bit of a sore arm and felt a bit off for a day and then I was fine and went back to work and went back to looking after my family or whatever it is that we all do. So I think the more that people can um, feel reassured that people around them are being vaccinated, the more we can get a buzz going about reopening our borders, about being able to book holidays, about being able to have loved ones come in from overseas and meet new babies, etc. The more that we can actually feel a collective sense of purpose, I think that will then become something that builds and, and kind of gathers strength like a rolling stone. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that. I want to bring Barbara in here. So Barbara, just on this, I suppose, a lot has been made recently uh, about um, the perceptual allegations of different messages, different communication messages being sent to different parts of Sydney in particular. You know, one message to one community, another to a, another community, so the argument goes. Um, is there anything in this that, you know, that, that you, can, you can have take up or fear of vaccination depending on the outcome? But essentially based upon how we communicate with different communities. What's your reaction to that allegation? Now, I want to speak about um, communication in general, and it goes back to what Katie has, has talked about, because I think communication overall in Australia could have been done better. And this is both for culturally and linguistically diverse populations, but for everybody as well in Australia. Because what I've found is that a lot of people, I mean, apart from the fact that they seem to be vaccine hesitant, they actually need to know why they need to have the vaccine, why it is important for them, and just even the basic science of what a vaccine is. And I've communicated to using very simple English terms, not using any um, jargon or anything like that, but explaining to people why we have to have the vaccine and what a vaccine is. And that sometimes gets people across the board if, if necessary. But what you're saying in particular about Sydney is that I think because of the, um, the way it has generally been handled where in some parts of Sydney there were some restrictions and were not in other not done as, as they were basically done differently across the board. So I think there's been a general resentment, particularly in some parts of Western Sydney around how restrictions were done and how communication was done overall. So I think overall, I think communication could have been done better for all um, part sectors of the Australian community. Okay, so can I press you slightly? I, I hear yeah. what you're saying, but, but in what sense? Could you give the audience a sense of how you might communicate differently? Is there a particular so, aspect of this that springs to mind? So what I find, find particularly in culturally and linguistically diverse communities, and I think Chris might have found this as well, because I know that he's been doing some work in this area, that having community talks and actually talking to people around why they need to have a vaccine, it dissipates a lot of fear. And so when people talk about flyers or um, sort of adverts on TV, some of those, that sort of information does not penetrate communities because people have genuine questions that are not well answered by, a, uh, for example, an advertisement. Sometimes people have questions around what do clots look like? If I have a clot, what will, what will it look like? Or why do I have to have a, va have a vaccine? or questions around, I work for childcare, why am I being forced to have a vaccine? So sometimes addressing people's questions on a personal basis sometimes helps to overcome some of these fears. Now, I know that we can't have community talks all over Australia. It's too expensive and too um, costly. And that's why we rely on people's general practitioners to do that sort of conversation when they're unsure about their vaccines. But for culture and industry diverse communities, I think it's important to engage with the communities, engage with their leaders, and 
pass along messages where you're actually answering people's questions and fears that they have about the vaccine. Okay, Barbara, thank you. Uh, Chris, you want to come in on this? I, I do. I suppose I'm just picking up on both Katie's and Barbara's uh, comments. When there's vaccine hesitancy or when we're in the context that's vastly different than international societies, we do what we're doing exactly right now. We have honest and open, transparent conversations about the, the benefits of vaccination and any potential risks of vaccination. We had evidence informed, we had data driven conversations with people and we explained it in a way which we uh, try to make sure that they understand. And clearly that's a very different context when you're speaking to uh, certain populations versus others. We need to continue to do this and I'm encouraging all people whether they're healthcare practitioners or otherwise, to talk about vaccines, talk about their vaccine experience and the benefits of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will come back. There's quite a lot more behind that, okay? Uh, but I'm going to shift gear now. I'm going to bring uh, my colleague Melinda in, and there's a whole range of questions around uh, pregnancy and breastfeeding. Can I just take them as, as they came in? The first one, Melinda, has to do with um, she, the question asked Does the COVID 19 vaccine pass? into my her breast milk um <clears throat> no <laughs> in the in the short answer um antibodies do uh from the covid vaccine um the recommended vaccination for uh pregnant and breastfeeding women is the mrna pfizer one in australia um and uh very, very unlikely that uh, that vaccine will pass into breast milk. Um, it pretty much stays actually just in the muscle where it's been injected. Um, if there was any vaccine that passed into the breast milk, it would likely be digested just like any other protein in the baby's stomach. So, um, yeah, short answer to that is no. <laughs> okay. Um, so, extending that, another question it says, and the question says, if I am breastfeeding and receive the COVID vaccine, does this also protect my baby? Yeah, so this is um, a question that I've, uh, I'm enjoying having the opportunity to answer. Um, mm. You get a lot of bang for buck when you vaccinate um, pregnant and breastfeeding women because uh, you do likely protect both. Um, we did expect uh, that vaccinating uh, pregnant and breastfeeding women would protect the infant based on what we know about other viruses and other vaccinations. Uh, and we do have uh, research that's showing us that uh, uh, antibodies to COVID-19 have been detected in cord blood, uh, which means that, uh, and this is the, of vaccinated pregnant women, and that means that um, the antibodies are passing via the placenta to the infant. And as far as breastfeeding is concerned, actually from an evolutionary point of view, lactation evolved as an immunoprotective secretion. The nutritional aspects of breastfeeding came as a secondary um, evolutionary um, development. Um, almost every component in human milk has an immunoprotective effect. Um, so we certainly expected that breastfeeding would actually be protective of the infant. Uh, we expected that antibodies would, uh, from a protected mother would transfer into uh, breast milk uh, via and be transferred to the infant via breastfeeding. We know that mothers um, exposed to virus, not necessarily, not COVID-19, we don't have the evidence specifically about this yet, but we know that mothers exposed to uh, virus even prior to pregnancy will generate antibodies that can be transmitted to the infant via breastfeeding during the lactation period. And we, can, we have seen that vaccinated mothers are passing um, COVID-19 antibodies to their infant. So I guess that's sort of encapsulating um, that it looks like it is quite a beneficial thing and it is recommended that breastfeeding and pregnant women be vaccinated. Okay, so can you just extend that point? So what the, the current guidance supports your earlier statement around the beneficial effects, is that correct? Yes, um, the, our recommendations are um, from a, a national level uh, that uh, pregnant and breastfeeding women um, be offered um, COVID-19 vaccination. Okay, and when you look internationally, is, do you see examples of similar advice and guidance being given in other countries or is Australia, is it typical or is it? Uh, yes, in fact, there was an uproar um, <laughs> when the vaccination first started to 
roll out because pregnant and breastfeeding women were excluded, um, as typically happens with new uh, medications, new treatments, uh, because you're considering two individuals, not just one. There's a lot of unknowns there. Uh, often uh, th these populations get excluded from trials. So early on, um, pregnant and breastfeeding women were not allowed to be vaccinated, and those that were working as health professionals in high-risk situations were not happy with this. Um, what we know about how the vaccines are working uh, led us to expect that there would not be um, any increased risk of adverse effects um, in pregnant and breastfeeding women compared to the general population. So those uh, recommendations did change and now it's certainly recommended. Um, and in Australia, we had the benefit of seeing all that play out and, uh, and being able to um, actually be in a situation when we do get supply of vaccines that we actually have some evidence to, to show that um, in this particular uh, situation, it's not just what we suspect, it is um, what we are seeing that um, it's effective and uh, as safe as it is in the general population. Just, Sorry, sure, just, just, just one other factor. We also know that pregnant women are at greater risk of severe COVID compared to non-pregnant women of the same age. So not only is there benefit for the child, but there actually is a greater need just because they're pregnant in themselves. So pregnancy is a recommendation for vaccine. Um, to reiterate Linda's point, it is common that pregnant women do not get included in clinical trials and we can put the ethics of that aside. I'm happy to discuss that later, but that's common. But importantly, we now have fantastic data as far as the safety of vaccines in pregnant women. They're being used internationally. And as supply comes on board, there will be a strong recommendation that all pregnant women um, get a vaccine to protect not only themselves, but their baby. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, what's your reaction, Melinda's reaction to the following question, which says, why are pregnant women not being treated as particularly vulnerable and therefore being prioritized, prioritized as a group in the vaccine rollout plan? That's a really difficult question. And it comes back to the fact that we're in a different situation in Australia to the situation that, we're, that the rest of the world is in. So um, pregnant women without other risk factors, uh, we need to take into consideration the fact that they are at this point in time, unlikely to get infected with uh, COVID-19. Uh, so, and we've had limited supply of vaccination. So they're certainly in the group that are recommended to have it. Um, Chris, I can't really answer why um, they haven't been added to the priority group, but I think it's really a, fact, a, a, a factor of the situation we're in where we don't have uh, much COVID-19 in our community. And also the challenge of that we remain in the supply constraints uh, environment at this stage. Um, pregnant women are going to be recommended to receive a vaccine. We just need to get to that point with sufficient supply to be able to do that. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I would ask pregnant women to watch this space um, over the next couple of weeks and months. So, so I, I don't want to draw you two out in terms of your official hat you're wearing, but as I'm hearing it, on the one hand, we have uh, clear evidence to suggest that they're more vulnerable, all things being equal, certainly relative to non-pregnant women. And you're saying once the supply side considerations are no longer there, in other words, neutral, they would be prioritised. In other words, the questioner's question would be met by making the priority group. That's the logic of where we're going. That's the logic of where we're going. But importantly, what I'm really trying to reach out is to pregnant women, once vaccine is available to you, I'm asking that they uh, take that on board. It is safe for them, safe for their child, and importantly, should be prioritised. We need to ac open up access to uh, a broader population than we are at the moment as more supply comes on board. And so pregnant women need to listen to that advice and talk to the healthcare practitioner. Um, I am encouraging pregnant women um, that they will need to be vaccinated once we do have sufficient supplies. Okay, right, thank you. Um, I'm going to pick up a couple of questions that I'm seeing online, going back to an earlier discussion, slightly more technical in nature. Uh, Archer, I wonder if I could bring you in. Uh, there's one question which says, what are the benefits, sorry, what benefits does mRNA -A vaccines have over traditional vaccines and why are we using these novel techniques now? And perhaps explain a little what mRNA vaccines are to the lay audience. Yes, thanks. 
So um, all living things use mRNA to uh, enact their function inside their cells. Um, but the mRNA vaccines for COVID-19 are the first example of us developing medicines um, that, that use these molecules. And um, this is really a culmination of many different, different scientific breakthroughs that have happened over the last decade. Um, and in particular, there's two companies that were set up to make these mRNAs, one being Moderna and the other being BioNTech. There are some others, but they're, they're the main ones. And actually, interestingly, they were set up to use mRNA to tackle cancer. Um, but over the years went after they were set up, they found that um, the mRNAs were not as effective um, at tackling cancer because they were eliciting a bit of an immune response that wasn't wanted. And those companies um, were really poised and they recognized that actually the, the method that they developed to make these mRNA molecules, which as I say, are naturally made in our cells, they, they worked out that this method was ideally suited to make vaccines. And that was before the pandemic hit. So they were at that point in the development of their technology where they had recognized that this was actually the best um, application. So when the pandemic hit, the platform was set up. These companies were set up to design and make these mRNAs, which are delivered into our cells and then instruct our cells to make the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And um, they were able to take the sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 genome and over the course of one weekend, design the vaccine to, to instruct our cells to make the spike protein. So it's the reason why we haven't had this technology before is simply because the breakthroughs in scientific research and the development, the establishing of these companies that were able to invest in this platform to set it up, were just not there before. Um, and, and it happens that their technology is most well suited to um, vaccination as opposed to their original um, therapeutic target, which was cancer, although they are now working on that and have ironed out um, some technical aspects to make it suitable there as well. So on that, um, Archer, is, could you comment on another question that uh, came in, which is, has that got a relationship to Australia's own production of its own vaccines and its capacity to do so? Clearly, we had a qu quite sizable shift in terms of what we were able to do and where we're going. Could you perhaps comment on that? Yeah, so because this is so new, and as I mentioned, there's very few companies um, that were developing this. Unfortunately, we didn't have prior to the pandemic companies that were also exploring this same um, mRNA platform. Um, although we do have a biotechnology sector and we do have uh, companies that make vaccines such as CSL, um, we did not have this particular platform set up. And, um, and so actually I've been part of a group that has been lobbying the government for, for a, about a year now to set up manufacturing of these mRNA vaccines here in Australia so that we can uh, make our own vaccines and really importantly so that we can make uh, vaccines in the future that might be suitable for any particular variants. We may develop who knows, looking into the future, we may develop variants that are specific to our region or our um, Asia Pacific region even. Um, and if we had this technology to make the mRNA vaccines ourselves, we could quickly redesign um, the vaccine to suit whatever variant is circulating for, for future boosters. Okay. And um, okay, we'll come back to that. Okay, I mean that's useful to know. So there's a couple other questions I want to draw yourself and Chris in, if I can, in particular. I'll just take them as I see them. Uh, the questioner asks as follows: I'm age 78. I've had my second AZ vaccination in late May. When can I anticipate having a booster? Shall I jump into that, Archer? Mm -hmm. Please. Okay. So, 
Um, fantastic. 78 had two doses of AstraZeneca. I would have confidence that you've had a good degree of protection against COVID, particularly the severe manifestations of COVID. What we don't know is how long that protection is going to last. We have data out to six to 12 months and protection is looking good, but as in all new programs such as this, we'll need to monitor that over time. So one, the immune system, particularly as the older you get, often doesn't produce as long and as strong an immune response. So we may need to boost that. The other factor that's contributing to the boosting discussion is clearly the virus is changing as well. So there's a possibility that we will need to modify vaccines based on that. What I can say to your person who's asked the question, I do not expect they'll need a booster in 2021. I think it's likely that we will be using boosters in 2022. And many countries are thinking of their booster programs at the moment. The United Kingdom is planning its booster program to roll out before winter, the Northern Hemisphere winter um, this year, and we will learn a lot from that. So um, I do expect that it re require a booster, what type of booster? I don't know at this stage. That may be an mRNA, but importantly, may be a number of other vaccine types that are also either in development or in manufacture at the moment. Okay. On a similar subject, maybe Archie, you can comment on this. Uh, the questioner says, please advise on the merits of a Moderna booster later this year for recipients who received both doses of AZ mid this year. So there's a bit of point about mixing up sort of vaccinations here. Yeah, so um, there may be others who are more on top of the latest data from there are trials going on elsewhere in the world about the merits of mixing uh, your vaccine technology types. And I believe that the preliminary data looks quite promising, um, but I would have to handle that. I don't know if anybody else is on top of the um, those those mixing trials. Shabit, do you want to jump into a yeah. uh, comment about mix yeah. and match? Mm -hmm. yeah. so when we first roll out vaccine programs, we roll out with the vaccine being the same, your first and your second dose. And that's where the greatest weight of evidence is at the moment, both how well it works as well as any side effects. And so we have an incredible amount of data about that. There is clearly going to be a need for mixing and matching schedules. So there's been a number of trials done, particularly in the United Kingdom, looking at mix and match schedules where you might use brand A for first dose and brand B for second dose. And actually, they're looking really quite attractive as far as being able to boost the immune system. So I do think mix and match schedules will come. What are we doing at the moment? Mix and match schedules are going to be relevant in Australia for those who particularly had a side effects against their first one, who we need to change. They're going to be relevant for those who've had a dose internationally, particularly if that vaccine is not available um, in Australia. But at the moment, we're sticking to what we call homologous programs, which is stick to the same vaccine. But as we move into the booster space, it is likely that we will be modifying that as that evidence comes on board. So to your question, um, realistically, booster programs will are likely boost with a different vaccine than your first program. And, and quickly, there's an online question about um, Germany doing this already. And, and, and is that a, a, an example of some sort of transfer or borrowing that we should be learning from? Well, I think we learn from all of these countries that are rolling out slightly different programs. The reason we're not going to programs such as Germany is we're still in the supply constraint environment. We've still got people who've not received their first dose of vaccine at the moment, so we're not going to rush to mixing and matching at this stage. However, we're going to learn a lot from these countries that are, and importantly, that will then inform our program going forward. Okay, Chris, thank you. Um, so, Katie, let's let's go back to where the conversation was a little while ago. I've, I've got a really good question here. Maybe, maybe you've seen it, the one that came in earlier on. And it says, um, the question says, the VAX discussion has become an emotional one. So, therefore, therefore, should we be appealing to people's emotions as well as the evidence? Yeah, so the answer to that, I would say, is, is definitely. I think different, and as has been stated already in this uh, webinar, Different groups, different people need different kinds of messaging. And certainly some research I've been involved in has shown that um, our values inform the kind of messaging that we want to hear and what, 
what appeal is going to work for me might not work for Archer and Melinda might want a different appeal again. So it's, you kind of need to have quite a few um, options available for people so that you can be communicating in different ways. What we do know from previous campaigns, there's a campaign called Get the Facts that the Commonwealth runs for childhood vaccinations. Um, and it contains information about the childhood vaccine schedule and the individual vaccines on it. But it also includes a lot of emotional stories about people who've had vaccine preventable diseases affect and in many cases, um, you know, actually cause the death of their children. And these families talk about those experiences and, and, and what that's like. And when the government had those campaigns um, evaluated, that was found to be a very successful part of those campaigns. So the emotion appealed to people. In fact, they went and used um, more families to talk about more diseases so that uh, people would think, well, it's not just, you know, we, we, we hear of children, for example, dying of whooping cough, but children also die of um, other diseases that we vaccinate against in Australia as well. So it's to actually talk about that and have that impact on people. So I think um, also some of the um, advertisements we've seen uh, internationally, I know I've had a real sense of FOMO at looking at some of these beautiful um, advertisements that appeal to our, um, appeal to our, the things that are important to us, like connecting with other people, going out dancing, you know, having, having that joy of life that's been so lacking, um, particularly around the world. Um, interestingly, there's been a wonderful um, advertisement made in Australia by the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. And if listeners haven't seen it, I do strongly encourage you to Google it. Um, and I, I really wish that that is an advertisement that had been made by government. It's, it gives you the feels, you watch it and you, it, it, talks, to, um, it talks to the togetherness. It, it kind of impl um, employs that language that we, we've often heard around, you know, we're all in this together. It makes us think about the benefits of vaccinating for ourselves and for others. And I think that kind of um, persuasion can be very powerful for some people, not for everybody, but I'd like to see some more use of emotion in that space. Yeah, I, I can hear that in your answer. So, so let's probe that a bit. Do you think there's potentially a risk in um, overdoing the evidence at some stage? I mean, this discussion has been heavily geared around me probing experts on some of the facts in response to the questions and they've, you know, they've provided some faithful answers. But in, in government and public policy, can we overdo it sometimes by providing people facts about things that perhaps they're not listening to? That's a really challenging question. And I think the answer to it is, is going to be context specific. And again, I can speak to some international evidence around providing evidence for vaccination. So when France decided to make more childhood vaccines mandatory in response to a range of uh, factors that led to declining coverage rates for childhood vaccines in France, they employed a website called Vaccine Info Service, and it was designed by the scientists um, and the communications people definitely didn't get the kind of final say about what was in there. And there was very technical language used and there was an extremely large amount of information placed online. And it almost feels a little bit defensive, like the government's going, well, you can't say we didn't tell you, you know, we told you everything. But um, when we analysed that for a recent research study, it was, you know, hundreds of pages of um, when we copied it out over into Word and sort of translated it, there was hundreds of pages of information there. And for the reader, that's not going to be easy to navigate or understand. Likewise, I think with COVID-19, it's challenging because some of the audience will want the technical information. And in fact, even for things like communicating the change in vaccine program, where Pfizer became the preferred vaccine for people under 50 and then under 60, you know, you have to you have to back that up. You have to tell people why you're making those decisions. You have to try and do so in a language that's, that's um, clear, that's not defensive, that's not um, overly complex, but that still gets across the really complex reasoning that professionals like Chris are making around um, weighing up the risks and benefits in a volatile environment where everything's changing all the time and oh now we've got the disease in New South Wales oh that's going to change that sort of decision making again so I feel like we we do have to be talking about the evidence we do need to be talking about the science we need to and part of me is is really optimistic in thinking wow you know the things that people in my life say to me about you know my life's work which was always this kind of weird niche thing and suddenly everyone's talking about anything from the you know the types of vaccines available to the concept of vaccine hesitancy and what causes it so 
I'm actually really um, moved and reassured by the public's engagement with and hunger for information and, and for this. But obviously, you know, it's horses for courses. People need to be able to access the information that's right for them, the messaging that's right for them in the context that's right for them. We seem to have lost Shamit. Losing our um, losing our moderator at <laughs> the <laughs> moment. Um, maybe Katie, why don't I jump in? There's a question on here that I can answer straight away. Amidst changing advice and varying medical opinions, what advice do you have for people in their fifties who's had their first dose of AstraZeneca and now hesitant about their second in view of the age recommendations to sixty? Again, I'm going to, I'll have to give some technical information here, so I'm thinking about your comment before. But what we know is that if you've received one AstraZeneca vaccine, the risk of a severe side effect from the second is incredibly low, of the order of one to two per million doses of the, so second dose recipients, the risk of the clotting disorder is one to two per million. And clearly that is incredibly small compared to the dramatic impacts you'll have as far as the benefits from a second dose. So my recommendation to that person is absolutely up to your second dose, now is the time. Uh, colleagues, can you hear me? I lost my link a moment ago, thank you. Okay, so I'm trying, trying to pick it up seamlessly, never easy. Um, I had a question just on the back of what uh, Katie was sharing earlier on. So we know in the case of not uh, support workers, care workers, um, there's discussion of making this mandatory um, and big hold in Australian public policy about not actually getting this done earlier on. So the general question that comes out of that is, how would you respond to um, a vaccine rollout that said it's going to be made mandatory, either for a specific group or for all of us? Katie. So this is an issue that's really close to my heart because I'm a scholar of mandatory vaccination and I was before COVID-19. So this is something I've been looking at for a number of years now. I think that the question of mandates is a, is a vexed question. Um, and I've studied the rollout of mandates for childhood vaccines in four um, jurisdictions, including Australia, and also Australia at the state level. What I would say is that mandates there can be a place for mandates. There can be a place for mandates only in a context of full supply and not just full supply, but easy supply, available supply. So certainly one of the things that we're hearing in our coronavax research that we're conducting here in Western Australia is healthcare workers and aged care workers having difficulty accessing the available vaccines, even in terms of things of timing like having the influenza vaccine is, is mandatory in some of these settings. And then the day that the vaccinators came around to give the COVID-19 vaccine, it was too close to the time in which the worker had been vaccinated for um, influenza. So then they've got to go and have that extra burden of getting themselves an appointment and finding a way to go and be vaccinated somewhere else. So in this imperfect situation, to tell people, well, you have to do it or you're not gonna be able to work is problematic especially when we're talking about some of the lowest paid workers in our country, many of whom themselves come from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. And as Barbara has already intimated, have not been uh, provided necessarily with helpful or persuasive communications around the benefits of vaccinating. So I think that, I think that it's government's job to make vaccinating as easy as possible for everybody. And it's a responsibility that I, find I'm increasingly talking about and emphasising because there's a lot of talk and a lot of the way we talk about and even the concept of vaccine hesitancy is very individualised. It's very much about putting the blame on the, the end user who is not vaccinated, who hasn't, hasn't made it happen. I think vaccination as a public health intervention by government is government's responsibility. We have to make some commitment, we have to turn up, but a lot of work has to be done in order to make that really easy so that there are not barriers in place. And so I think talking about things like mandates and look, in, a, in an aged care setting, I think ultimately you're going to want extremely high levels of vaccination and mandates probably are appropriate. But to be talking about them when you've got this very imperfect supply scenario 
when it's really difficult for people who are trying to do the right thing and who want to be vaccinated, but also, you know, don't want to necessarily miss a day's pay to get vaccinated or who might have to travel. Certainly one of my former neighbours, um, she didn't drive. So, you know, even, even just getting to work, she relied on other people to get to work. So for her to then have to go and get a vaccine as well, not necessarily easy. So I think we really need to dig deep and make sure that government's doing its job before we start saying to people, you know, well, there's going to be a punishment or a consequence if you haven't vaccinated. Okay, so that, that's on sticks. Let's, let's stick with carrots for a moment. I'm going to bring Barbara in. And, and Barbara's done some work, particularly amongst uh, regional communities and Indigenous communities. So there's questions around messaging, Barbara. I wanted you to talk about particularly, you know, what, what are we getting right, what are we getting wrong and why? And also, where would, be, where would the role of incentives be? Not, not the sticks, but the carrots for a moment. And then I'm going to come back to you, Katie, and ask you the question that comes from North America, which would, would you pay people to get vaccinated? Barbara. You're muted, Barbara. I did the unmute, the mute thing. So um, I haven't done any specific studies around um, in regional um, um, Australia around COVID in particular or indigenous population. So I cannot answer to um, what's going on in those areas in, in general. But what I will say is that I do know that, especially when the COVID pandemic started, that there was a lot of effort within the indigenous communities and particularly supported by their elders, scientists, um, the federal government, state governments, but particularly the primary health care um, Aboriginal community services did a lot of work in trying to control the spread. And in fact, I think one of the most successful things we've seen across Australia is that we've had very few numbers of indigenous people affected um, by COVID-19. And I do know that they've had a lot of efforts and we had at the immunization conference that they've also had relatively high rates of vaccination comparable to other Australians. So um, they're not any, we don't have significant issues in terms of rates of, um, um, of, um, of vaccination overall in indigenous communities. But that said, I think the, for all, whether or not regional um, or indigenous people or culturally and musically diverse groups, which I keep coming back to, I think the messaging is really important. But again, as Katie said, also um, making sure that access is available for all people, regardless of where they are in Australia. In terms of incentives, and maybe Katie will speak more to that, I, I personally don't think that incentives are very useful. I think the most important thing is communication and ensuring that people know why we have to be vaccinated. And sometimes the incentive is not so much giving people money, beer or things like that, but the incentive should be that I want to travel, I want to be healthy, I want to protect the people around me. I think that is what we need to um, convince people about. But I don't know if anybody else has data on whether incentives work um, more or less in different communities. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so just to add to that, um, I, and you mentioned the North American example and paying people, I think providing things like um, public or private transport vouchers, things that actually help the vaccination encounter to happen, or allowing people, allowing casual workers to access um, money if they need to have a day off work following the vaccine or to, to get the vaccine. So things that directly connect to the vaccine encounter, I think are really appropriate incentives. Um, in our Coronavax research project, we asked people about mandates and about incentives. People preferred the idea of incentives to mandates, but they also said that um, incentives shouldn't be large and certainly the international evidence suggests that as well, because that can be seen as coercive, especially for people who are lower in on lower incomes. Um, some of our uh, community participants talked about incentives as weird or like bribery. So really, you know, my position on this is that the incentive shouldn't be the difference between you getting vaccinated or not if you were unsure about it or didn't want to. It's more that the incentive should be a sweetener, something that makes the vaccine encounter easier and things that are easier, we, we do. Like if, if there's a barrier in the way to doing something, yeah, we get, we'll, we'll get round to it, we'll get there. But you, you remove those barriers, you actually change human behaviour. So incentives that are set up that way would be effective. And also in terms of paying people, I mean, I think a really good example to think about here is, you know, we don't pay people for blood donation in Australia. We have a wonderful culture of people that roll up their sleeves and donate blood regularly or plasma. 
and I think that that's handled really well. You know, you you do get a little um, a little bonus afterwards. You get a cup of tea or a milkshake. You get your little chocolate bar. And in fact, I think the, the food was really good last time I went. So, you know, I remember as a, as a poor student that it was a, you know, it was a buzz on blood donation day because I'd get a decent morning tea. So I think things like that are not coercive in any way. They're not going to be the difference between you going or not going, but they might help to, um, yeah, to kind of increase or enhance that experience. Thank you, Katie. Look, so time is slipping by. Um, I'm going to begin wrapping up. I'll ask everyone to give, frankly, just a two or three line answer to the following question. Um, if we all gathered 12 months from now in the middle of July 2022, and we've got a further year's worth of experience, assuming the global pandemic remains sort of constant, you know, in that sense, yeah? But just on the vaccination side, in terms of our strategy for dealing with it, remember, it's got a lot to do with the extent to which we can open up and so on. Um, are you optimistic or pessimistic? Do you think that it's going to go well or not go well? And just very quickly, why? What stands out in all of this? Is it communications? Is it the technical issues? Is it misunderstanding? Is it overloading of factual evidence or, or any other factor? But very, very quickly, I'm just going to go around. Where, where would you imagine we come out 12 months from now in terms of vaccinations here in Australia? Uh, Melinda, I'm going to bring you in first. I would expect that um, the pregnant and breastfeeding community are relatively uh, keen to be vaccinated. So I would expect from that point of view, it would be relatively well taken up. Um, I think we need to be very careful again about our messaging for um, that particular community. Uh, there are concerns about whether there's effects on fertility, which there's no evidence that there is. There are concerns uh, that are specific to that particular group. And my particular um, community do tend to read a lot of the science and they need help interpreting the results of, of those papers. Um, and so we need to make sure we get our messaging right for that, for, for the, that community. Well, thanks, Melinda. Archer, briefly. So I'm an optimist. <laughs> The federal government has announced that they will be supporting a company that is yet to be decided to establish onshore manufacturing of mRNA vaccines. I would, even though I'm an optimist, I think it's unrealistic that in a year's time we will be making our own mRNA vaccines here. Hopefully it wouldn't be too long after. So what I would envisage is that the supply shortages that we haven't really touched on, although we've mentioned it, we haven't really explained the reasons for that. But I would hope that in a year's time, we are looking in a much, much better position in terms of um, addressing those supply shortages. And ideally with our own um, vaccine production ramping up. Thank you. Chris. Couple of things. Um, I think COVID is still going to be with us in 12 months time. It's likely to be circulating and it might look different than it is right now. Um, I'm really looking forward to a time when we don't have constraints on vaccine supply because I'm an optimist. The vast majority of Australians believe in vaccination, the importance of vaccination. And so those people will be coming forward to be vaccinated. Um, I think that we will have opened up more than we are at the moment. And so we may be in a situation where COVID is circulating in our community at that stage. And I'm hoping that given what we've seen from other countries that we've provided sufficient protection to people the community that our health systems are preserved despite that circulation. So I am an optimist, but I also understand the challenges that are ahead. Thank you. Um, Barbara? I'm an optimist too. By this time next year, all our borders will be open, um, both internal as well as international, and people will be traveling. But my major worry is that if Australia and other countries do not support um, countries in Africa and Asia, we will continue to have circulation of virus there and we may continue to have mutants of all types and sizes. So um, I'm an optimist, but if we do not ensure that we have control of this virus world over, we will continue to be exposed to different types of mutants, as I said, because as long as the virus is circulating somewhere, mutants can, um, can develop. So I'm sure Australia will be open, but we will we'll still have pockets in some countries if we don't get on top of it well, as a global effort. Okay, thank you. And, and lastly, Katie. I want to echo Barbara's point. I think this is a global security issue. 
human security. Uh, we need to protect people everywhere against COVID-19 and, and wealthy countries. Once we have our own populations covered, we definitely have to be doing our bit uh, to make sure we have to be doing more than we are. In terms of our own coverage here in Australia, like the other panellists, I'm an optimist as well. We are a nation of vaccinators and I, you know, I believe that given the right conditions, and that includes full supply, but also effective and persuasive public communications, well-resourced health providers who can have conversations with people who are unsure or who have complex you know, health scenarios. We've had a few of those sent in to us. My Coronavax project is that I work with Chris. We're also regularly getting kind of health questions from people that, so there seems to be a, a demand out there for people who have complex needs that is not yet being met. So we have a long way to go and it has to be multifaceted but I'm confident that we can also reach high coverage. The other point I would make is that, um, judging by the recent research we've done in the Coronavax project, we seem to be a population that is quite um, consenting of being heavily governed. And we've been heavily governed in the recent times um, through lockdowns, through border closures, et cetera, um, that have managed to keep COVID out of our communities. And we've become used to that. And so I might say we've become complacent with that. Um, what, what we have also found in our study is that that seems to come with a high expectation that governments might impose some requirements around vaccination that obviously would not yet be um, determined or, but certainly things like um, leaving and coming back, for example, it, it's hard to imagine that there wouldn't need to be stringent requirements in place or opt-outs that involve, um, you know, self-funded quarantine, um, perhaps hotel quarantine initially for those who don't want to be vaccinated. So I think there will be community support for governments taking measures um, that help get that coverage out there. But I also think there'll be really strong community support for the vaccines themselves once the conditions are right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, panel. Look, time really has slipped by. Um, I dare say we'll come back to this before 12 months from now. There's many other aspects, not just of the vaccination program, but actually all different issues that have arisen as part of your answers to these questions. But first of all, can I just thank the panel for taking the array of questions? I think we've done justice to the ones I saw previously and a fair number of the ones that came in online. Apologies to individuals. We didn't actually get to your question, but it's always difficult in a 60 minute slot. Um, can I also, um, so let the audience know that uh, the written versions of, of part of this will be available from the UWA Impact website. That's uwa.edu.au forward slash impact. Uh, so you can find more uh, uh, written um, material there. Um, secondly, there's a plug for a forthcoming event the Institute will be holding on the 9th of September, if you're interested. It will be an in-live, in-person live event here in Perth, but we'll also be live streaming it. And it's dealing with uh, surprise, surprise, COVID, but in this case, borders. The title of the event is Fortress Australia, an issue of borders going forward, uh, likely to attract an awful lot of interest. 7th of September, please join us if you can in, in presence or virtually. And the last thing I just briefly want to thank is my colleagues who sat to my right, Rebecca here and Anna over here, who you can't see without whom this event would not have been possible. So thank you very much to both of you. Um, we will uh, return again in the future. Hopefully we've done some justice to this topic and fulfilled at least some of our obligations about uh, straightening out facts where we can. Thank you. Have a pleasant evening.